Okay, so we have these basic walls here. If we want to start going through and customizing these walls, there's really an awful lot of things we can do to them. Okay, one thing that you may want to do to your walls is if you start having a space that has very much a like a molding to it, if you have any sort of like baseboards or crown moldings or uh, kind of belly bands or chair rails, whatever it is, it's pretty easy to go through and add things like that into a model like this. By default, we just sort of show these very, very plain walls. Like, we we'll gonna put a floor on this, this will make it look a little bit better. So I'm gonna go through and just choose, uh, put a floor in here, and then we'll go ahead and just think about trying to apply some moldings to all this stuff. I'll go to level one. I'm going to draw it on level one because I actually want to place the floor at level one. And the best thing to do is actually sort of place elements on the level where they're actually going to ultimately live. So I can choose the floor tool. Over here in the property palette now, the type selector is here, but it's always visible. And I can say, oh, let me go ahead and grab a nice wood joist floor with a wood finish to it. Okay, and now we can start drawing our floors. Now, for drawing our floors, there's a number of ways we can do this. Okay. We can just go ahead and use the tools that are kind of hanging around over here, up in the palette, to actually just draw shapes. We can draw a boundary, we can draw just any sort of shape we want to kind of wrap around and do that. What I tend to like to do, though, is actually go through and use picking of walls to actually determine where the floor boundaries are. And the reason you like to do that is that if the walls move, the floors will move with it. So if your design keeps on changing, the floor will update nicely. So for example, I can come over here and as opposed to drawing a line, I can pick a wall. And when you pick a wall, you have the choice of really coming on over and selecting different walls. And what it'll do is it'll hug up into the wall. Where it actually goes to, which is actually sort of a smart construction detail, is it actually goes into the wall really to the outer side of the structural layer. So if it's a brick wall or a block wall, we go to the outside of the block. It's a, like a frame wall to go to the outside face of the studs. It actually pulls the floor out to a relatively nice spot in there. And if you go through and choose those, you can be fine. Let me go through, I'm just going to close the back end of this since I don't have any walls on the back side of my structure here. Let me show you just other little random kind of techniques. Yeah, as you're going through and creating floors, you know, one of the most important things for a lot of different operations in Revit is you need to have a nice continuous boundary, a pink boundary that goes all the way around and encloses things. So if you have a disconnect, you can go through and grab that pink line and stretch it, but a really good tool for you all to become very familiar with is the trim tool. So what that does is it lets you go through and choose two different lines and it'll basically either bring them together, it'll extend them or cut them off, but it'll bring them together into a nice clean corner. Okay, that's just kind of a little kind of quick shortcut for doing stuff like that. Let me close that on up and we'll actually have a floor to work with. Okay, and I'll go back over to my 3D view so I can see how we're doing. Looking pretty good. Okay. What I'm going to do now is actually just add a little more detail into my walls. So my walls are kind of okay. They have this kind of jip board kind of color to them right now. It's kind of really dull and gray right now. If I want to sort of brighten that up, I could go ahead and change the material properties with that a lighter appearance so they just don't look kind of quite so flat. Doing that's pretty easy. If you want to open up that wall, you can choose it and edit it. And you can actually sort of see what it's made of. And if I go scrolling on down through the list, you'll actually see it's made of some material that says gypsum wallboard on the inside. And we can either open that up here, or let me show you another way to get to where gypsum wallboard is. We can go into the Manage tab, and you'll find there's a whole materials dialog, which is really, this is where you guys probably spend a lot of time, just defining different types of materials and thinking about what their shaded appearance is like, what the coloring is like, and ultimately, what the rendering appearance is like. So let's go ahead. I'm going to find that gypsum wallboard. And you'll see it kind of has a so kind of default, kind of dark gray kind of color to it right now. If I'd like to go ahead and in my model shade it to a different color or even render it to a different color, what I need to do is just sort of start changing its properties a little bit. And I can do that a couple of different ways. I can just go ahead and choose a new color right here, and that'll be used for the shading. But an even better way, if you know you're going to render it ultimately, is to go to the Appearance tab and choose a rendering appearance for it, and then let it 
use the shading of the rendered here. It's kind of the primary color when it's pulling out a photograph. Okay? And uh, use that for the shading. And that way you always sort of have a correspondence between how it's going to look when it's uh, rendered and how it looks when it's just shaded. So uh, get a little feedback from that stuff. So if you want to do that, what I'll do is I'll just switch over to the Appearance tab. I can go down and let me go ahead and just choose a nice paint finish. And you can see there's a lot of predefined paint colors. Let me go for, oh, I'll just choose that white color for now. But if we want to go through and create our own color in terms of what's going on, we can go ahead and start adjusting that. If we want to do things like, for example, for the paint, go through and choose a slight tint to it. So I want it to be, oh, kind of slightly towards tan or slightly towards brown or some other color. I can choose another color just right here. And what it'll do is it'll actually mix that into the paint. So the paint will actually have a little bit of that tint to it. We have the whole issue of whether or not it's glossy or not. Sort of a high gloss finish versus a relatively flat finish. And let me warn you about that just a little bit. Yeah, when you render very, very glossy things, it's actually is a little bit difficult because the amount of like reflection that's coming off and how that affects the light that's bouncing off things, it sometimes is a little bit kind of hard to control or very, very glossy things don't render very well. It's hard to kind of do a very nice rendering of a mirror surface, something like that. So think about what the degree of flatness is that you want to have. Let me just say okay to that. We'll talk more about materials in a bit. But what I want to show you is that if we choose that, oops, I shouldn't have closed the whole thing. Let me go back to that dialog and I was going to take you back to the other tab. Okay, here's the appearance tab. If I go back to now the graphics tab, that's where the shading is uh, determined, I can actually say use the render appearance and what it'll do is it'll grab that color. It'll grab that color from the paint and kind of bring it on over. Okay, and now hopefully that looks a little more reasonable for what we want. Actually, let me kind of show you another kind of like a variation in this whole scheme. Generally, when you say shaded, it takes into account the effect of the sun and where the positioning of the lighting is. So this wall is appearing much lighter than that wall over there, and it's really just because of where the light is right now in the scheme. If as you're designing, you don't want to do that because you really want to think of those as being the same color, okay, and understand it as being more even. Okay. One thing that got added, is this notion of consistent colors versus shaded. Consistent colors just, it'll keep the right tint, it'll keep the right kind of tone to that, but it won't go ahead and incorporate the effect of the lighting. So if you, as you're designing, are bothered by the fact that something is shading darker than others, just go back to consistent colors. And go, yeah, something that's more predictable about how it's going to look. Okay, so far so good. Okay, let's go ahead and add some detail into this wall. Because this plain old wall with my sheetrock coming on down and hitting the wooden floor isn't quite right. We might want to put some baseboards in here, or maybe some crown molding, or some sort of other detail into it. But if you want to do something like that, it's really pretty easy. Let me show you how that works. Okay. What you can do is, under the Home tab, at the bottom of the Wall tools, there's this actual thing called the Wall Sweeps. So let's think about what that's good for. The idea is, when you take any profile, any sort of crown molding profile, or baseboard profile, or any sort of profile, and just run it all the way around the room. And it's actually very smart about what it does, because when you run that around the room, it'll respond to things like doors being cut out and windows being cut out. It'll actually sort of leave gaps where those things are so that you don't have all those things intersecting. So using these sweeps is really a good way to do any sorts of applied moldings, something like that. So let's kind of show you how that works. I'll choose wall sweep. There's only one sweep defined right now, some sort of cornice, okay, some sort of crown molding. I could choose that if you just want to sort of experiment what that's like. And if I come on over into the room, you'll see that I basically have some sort of piece of molding here that I can put up at, oh, a height. If I come over to this wall, it'll put it over at that wall and kind of continue it around. Now, that's not a great looking piece of molding. We'll go ahead and kind of adjust that in a little bit. But what I do want to show you about how it works is that if there's a door or a window, 
I'm going to go ahead and put a door in here. I'll put a door over on this side and maybe a window in here too. We'll put some windows in. No trim, but it'll be enough to get us started. If I take that, and I can even move it down, watch what happens. When you come through and it actually gets to the point where it either would intersect with the door or window, it'll leave that out. It'll actually sort of be relatively smart about what it's doing. So it's pretty nice if you have to go through and try to put moldings in to go through and do that with this Wall Street floor. This it does a lot of work in terms of uh, oh, kind of getting to about the right height and kind of making things happen. Yes? Can you um, give it away to the so they can wrap around, let's say, the top or the bottom of the thing? There isn't a no. There's not an automatic. I wish there were. That would be a really good feature in terms of doing it. We'd have to almost. We'd have to actually add another sweep to kind of like do that. To have to really, yeah. And you, and you just uh, now, if you did another sweep, and you did around the window, would you still have to do the window? So if you chase, change the window, it changes. Sure, we can. Let's show you how that would work. That's actually kind of a really good question. It's kind of this whole idea of if I let, let's put something around one of those windows. On a project with some rather interesting windows. Sure. Let Let's show you how that works because, like, for example, these windows over here are incredibly boring, right? There's no detail, no molding to them, nothing in there that's at all looking interesting. You probably have something that's going to look a lot more interesting, and you might want to sort of put some sort of sweep around them. So let's show you what that might look like. Okay, what I'm going to do is I am going to go through and put in something called an in-place component. And in-place components are really what we create whenever we want to have a custom piece of geometry that's really very dependent on the geometry of the other elements in the model. So as opposed to a completely generic family, let me talk about this, we could go two ways. We could go ahead and take this family and add some trim to the family so that we would then have window with elaborate trim as a separate type. And if we're going to reuse that an awful lot, that may be a good strategy because it's very reusable to be able to use it in a lot of different places. If I just want to do something special for this window and maybe that window, and it's going to be very dependent on this geometry, I just do an in-place component. So the general thing to think about is whenever you start doing an in-place component and you do it more than two or three times, it might want to actually become a family. Okay, but often in-place components are how you get started. In fact, in-place components like do you ever do countertops? You know, countertops, kitchen counters, bathroom counters, stuff like that. You know, in place geometry is really the way to do that. Do you ever do in place components? Okay, you're good on that stuff. Beautiful. Okay, because that's really the way to do things like that whenever you really have to make the geometry fit what's happening in the model. But let's take a look at this issue of the windows and how we can do that. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, let's go through and under the Home tab, I'll create a model in place. We're going to choose what this is that we're putting this together. And when you put a piece of trim like it together, do you call that a window or do you call that a piece of casework? It's a, it's a with a window? We'll call, I'll, I'll put it in the window family. This is really just going to control where it shows up in the visibility, you know, whether it does, appears with the windows or not. But everyone has a slightly different way of thinking about that. Okay, and I'm going to call this, oh, oops, hang on just a second. I do this thing with my keyboard. Sometimes when I set it up and it takes over and does magical things that I don't understand. And it's doing it right now. Let me see if I can get rid of it. No. Hang on. <laughs> I hate it when it does this. But I've never figured out, it's one of these magical things, I've never figured out the pattern well enough to be able to stop it. Bam. Okay. Window. Trim. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go through and create a sweep. And a sweep is really, as most of you know, just a way of basically taking a path and kind of running some profile around. Let me choose a path. I'll pick a path. Since I already have some nice 3D geometry, I can even say pick 3D edges and let me just grab that edge, this edge, and this edge. Now, if that path is a little bit too extreme, I really want to have it stop right where that molding stops. I can kind of shorten the path a little bit. Do something like that. 
But what we have now is basically this line and we're going to put some sort of profile that traces that line. When we're happy with the path, we can say finish by clicking the check mark. And then we can go out and sort of choose which profile we want. Now, I don't think I have, well, I have some profiles in here. Nothing too awfully interesting. I'm just going to go ahead and put in this like a uh, one by four or a one by six, something like that. We'll start with that, then I'll show you how to make it a little more elaborate. I'll do put like just a little piece of one by four trim around it. Okay, you'll see here it is. It's going to draw it towards the inside right now, and I can decide whether I want to flip it. That's actually flipped it the wrong way. Let me try the other thing. Let me go ahead and give it a horizontal profile offset. Let me try setting it off minus four inches back. See if that does any better. I think that actually got worse. Let me try this. I'm basically just trying to figure out, since I'm sort of there, okay, there it finally went to the outside. I'm trying to figure out where to locate that and sort of its sense of X and Y and my sense of X and Y are a little bit off right now. But once I've sort of located that profile, I can say let's complete the profile and go ahead and draw it around there. And so that's kind of one piece of trim we can go ahead and apply to something like this. Now the good thing is, and let's see if this actually works, this should actually work. If I go through and finish the model, then I take that window and I slide it on down, okay, the trim will follow it. And the reason the trim is following it is because I picked the edges as opposed to drawing. Whenever you pick things, you're saying, hey, there's some interesting piece of geometry here. I want to be attached to that piece of geometry, okay? And that's always the more powerful way to do it. Whenever you can pick things, all the better. The nice thing is, I think this will work. Let's try it. Even for this window, it's a 36 by 48. Let's go ahead and make it a 24 by 48. Okay, it's still going to resize. So if I made it wider, shorter, whatever it is. Let's see what will happen. That will be sort of an interesting thing in terms of what's going to go you're on. because Oh, you're, you are good at breaking. Let's try it. If I move it up, okay, it moved it up. It wasn't smart enough to extend the sketch on down. Okay, so at least hung to the dimensions. So, you know, that, that's the breaking point. It's like it, it'll shrink as long as it could hang on to where it was sort of anchored, it's doing okay. But it didn't go, it wasn't smart enough to do that but final thing. Last understand, the reason I you need to know whenever the algorithm breaks is so that you don't get flustered when it, you know what it can do. And if you're going to move something or make a change, you know that at some point there's certain things you just can do. It's not a big deal. Yeah. You just have to know where that point is. Exactly. And control that and yeah, because it's it's never tragic. It's always just, it's always gonna happen. Yeah. All software, no matter what version, it always you're gonna run into these limitations where you're trying to model something it's just not so good at. And you sort of need to know where that edge is and then you always have the extra little workarounds in your back pocket for how to like uh, you know, mess around with that stuff. Okay, now, this profile wasn't a very interesting profile, it turns out. It's got a big old flat piece. If you have some really nice, elaborate profile with some rounding and some all sorts of interesting things going on, let's show you how you do that. You can either go through and draw a profile that we can kind of keep on reusing, or let me edit this thing. I'm going to edit the sweep. And then finally, I'm going to say, let me, um, oh, what is it? What I really want to do is edit the profile. Profile, oh, what I have to do is say sketch a profile as opposed to using one of the existing ones. Let's say you actually wanted to go to draw your own profile in here and really have something quite custom. What you can do is I really have like a plane that's really attached right here to these like uh, four little coordinates you see. And if I want to start drawing, got to find where my drawing tools went now because they're around here somewhere. There's my drawing tools. I think, no, I'm not doing the right thing. Modify sweep, I'm looking and what happens is my uh, place lines, there it is. Okay, it's over there. Let's try this. No, it's not, hang on, I'm, mess I'm messing up right now. So let me uh, pop back out of there. Let us try that again. I'm gonna edit the sweep. I'm gonna say that we're gonna select a profile and we're gonna sketch a profile. 
And then what happens is my dial, my screen gets a little strange in terms of being able to see things. So I don't see the drawing tools, which is what I'm looking for right now. So edit the profile. There we go. Jeez Louise. Okay. That was a long way to get there. Let me kind of show you what's going on. I think there's actually what I think of as a bug of the software when I say select the profile and I say by sketch. Okay. If the edit the profile button isn't always there, sometimes you have to like choose that again and then choose it a second time. But in any case, I'm trying to get to these drawing tools. Okay. What do you do with those drawing tools? You start actually drawing out the profile you want. So I want to do something like this that comes on out and then has some little bit of rounding to it. Then I'll go through and kind of make it straight again. Maybe bring that back at a slight taper, whatever it is. I'm going to have some sort of profile that I'm going to draw on there. And when I finish that up and finish the profile and then I'll finish the sweep, okay, I'll get this very elaborate kind of crown molding or this molding all around the windows. So you can really make this sort of as elaborate or as plain as you want to. It's really neat. And sometimes we'll have to do this out of several pieces, but I'm doing a lot of old historic renovations. Where all I have to do is I'll have you know, one whole thing, which is kind of the uh, down profile, a whole other thing, which is the head profile. Sometimes you have to make the head profile, the crown molding around the head. Often you build these things up in a lot of different little pieces. But this is kind of this issue of you can do this an awful lot, as opposed to doing it on a one-off, window-by-window basis. It may be better to actually go into the window itself and put it over there. Okay. So if you wanted to do that, have you done things like editing the window families? Okay, so some people are not the heads. That okay, but let me gotta show you real quickly. If you wanted to do this instead, just right in the window. What you could do is as follows, because you decided, hey, you need a window that actually has this molding. I'm going to do this all over, and I want it to stretch very smartly throughout the place. I can choose that family, that plain old window family, and one of the things that's going to be available is this notion of actually editing the family. If you edit the family, here is really the underlying component. Okay, this is it. We can go ahead and take a look at it in terms of the placement side or the back side. It looks like I'm looking at the back side now. That's the front side of it right now. If I wanted to go through and add that sweep right into the family, I'd actually do an incredibly similar thing. I'd take the sweep tool, I'd pick the path, I will say I'm done picking the path, and now let me go through and sketch a profile. Maybe I'm going to have it kind of come on over, come out, whatever it is. I'm going to put some weird looking piece of trim on this thing. Finish that up. Let's see what it's doing there. What's it asking me? Finish that. Okay. I chose those three. There it is in terms of coming all the way around. Now, I have that trim running around the three sides of the window right now. Here's something you probably want to do. Since the default window doesn't have that trim, and if you don't want to add that trim to every window that's using that default fixed window, you know, because it'll update them all, what you probably want to do is go save as and save this as your own custom family. This is going to be your custom family for your project that has the specific type of trim you need. No worries. I will go through and say save as. Put it on out there. I'm just going to put it in my documents folder. Ultimately, you should put this in your project library so that the other people can uh, share it with you. I'm going to cut my custom fixed window with moldings or with trim. And what I'm going to do is load that back into my project. So what was the advantage of doing this? It's that now, if I go through and place a window, I can either change this one to have it, and I'll change it from fixed to be custom fixed with trim. and It'll kind of pop it right in there. Or if I go placing a lot more of the windows that have it in there, they'll already have that molding on there. So it's really, just think about this relative to the notion of really how often you need something you're going to do an awful lot. And then think about building it into the family and then it's going to be smart as you keep on resizing the window. It will do it for all the different windows you need. Okay, a couple other kind of random things to kind of show you that you're sort of new and interesting to work with. 
like the whole notion of taking walls and changing the color of the walls or maybe putting a new material on the walls, they're pretty good on that. It's pretty much good on the materials dialogue. Like, again, I can say it's a wood wall or a wallpaper or whatever it is that we're going to put on this wall. Okay. A classic problem we have, though, is this whole thing about you know, how do you handle the whole issue of, you know, I want gypsum up here, but I want wood paneling down there. Okay. Or you only want things to be sections of things to sort of have uh, appearance you know, that's different from the others. Because okay? it really doesn't make sense to go ahead and create 15 different wall types that have all different appearances to them. Okay? So there's actually kind of a really new tool available that came out in 2012 that actually helps you with that a little bit. And it's something called parts. So I'm going to show you what it is because it may come in handy for you in terms of doing stuff like this. Yeah, we've done this in a lot of different ways before. Do you guys ever do split surface? Okay, so that's kind of, okay, let's show you different ways of doing this. I got a wall here. My wall is looking pretty good in terms of what's going on. I decided that I want to go through and make, oh, this lower portion of the wall over here something different. I want some sort of special wainscoting in there. So what I can do, I can have a lot of different choices. One is I can choose the wall. Okay. The problem is if I paint the wall or change it, it's going to change everything. There's this tool over here called splitting the face. And what splitting the face does, and it's kind of a good way to get started, is it'll let you go ahead and choose that wall and kind of like editing a wall profile it'll show you the boundary of the wall it's all showing up a big old orange line here okay and if i want to say that this surface is going to be different than that surface have two different materialities okay. what i can do is actually just draw a line that separates those two things we're going to split it into two separate things so i can come over here i'll run right over to there and when I close it, what will happen now is actually this will be a little bit different than that in terms of the materials. So if you now want to go through and paint, for example, what I can do is, oh, I'll go through and choose some other material, not the jip board. I'll make it something, oh, really outlandish. So you'll see it like this tile or something like that, or this little mosaic tile, something like that. What I'll do now is when I choose, as opposed to choosing the entire wall, I can just choose that little piece that I split off. Okay, and now it's the only part of it that got changed as opposed to the entire things. So you can split off little parts and do what you want to that list. That's, you know, file that away in your list of tricks because that's actually kind of a really easy way to kind of change just pieces of it. Do you have any link to the list of tricks? Yeah, no, nope. you can kind of keep on splitting and splitting within splits. So, so what's it do to the overall file size? Nothing. It's really, it's really, well, it's just one of the little pieces of information. It's very, 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 very good of a impact in terms of doing that. So that's kind of the, the easy, kind of cheap way to do something like that. So paint if you want the entire surface, split if you only want part of it. I actually run into that a lot because, for example, I'll be going ahead and I really have one gigantic wall, which is the entire side of the building, and I want to paint the walls in this one room, but I don't want to paint the walls in the room next door. Even though it's the same long wall, I can split off just this section and paint this by accident color in here and not necessarily have to choose all the ones kind of next door. Okay, so think about that as a way to kind of do things. That's kind of a good one. Yes? The same kinds where we do floors? Um, floor, let's try floors. Actually, it's interesting. I never split floor surfaces, but let's try it. I have another way for doing that if you need it, but let's try to see if that'll work. Let me choose the floor. Well, not. That's interesting. Can I split a floor? Those are the kind of questions I have. Oh. Challenging. Yeah. On the edge, looks like I was able to grab it. I think it's going to work. So let me kind of do something like this. Now this only splits surface, not the geometry. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So this is really yes. It's just it's it's painting. It's painting a subregion. Okay. okay. And that's okay. So now with this, exactly. I can let me go ahead and I'll do that same kind of material just because it's easy right there. Put it right there. Okay, so if you need to go through and create a nice parquet or like a checkerboard pattern floor or something that has like some sort of inlay of different materials and stuff like that, that's looking groovy. Okay, yeah, it can really actually be, you know, a lot of times we have these very organic shapes where one surface flows into another and stuff like that. So if you just want to vary the materiality, okay, without actually having to create two or three different floors, that's a really easy way to do it. 
So splitting is a good thing. I like splitting. And hopefully it'll actually uh, buy you some uh, mileage in terms of doing things. Another thing that I like to use every once in a while is decals. Do you use decals? Let me show you the decals. Decals are great if you want to put art on the wall okay, or you have a photograph of a space that's incredibly ornately detailed. There's a whole bookcase and books and stuff. And you need it in the background, but you don't really need it for what you're doing. You just need it to establish context. Or if you want to put a picture on a TV screen, anything like that. Okay. Here's how decaling works. And if there's something like this, Nikki, this would have cut your rendering time in half. Okay. So let me show you how this works. Decals are, think of it as really, it's like just putting a big old postage stamp or a piece of wallpaper up that just has an image on it. Okay, and where that is, is let me go into the insert menu. Oh, it always takes a minute for me to find it. It is not manage images. There it is, decal. Thanks. This is one of the things that I'll be the first to confess is confusing for me is everyone. Like every version, they seem to move things around between the different tabs and stuff like that. So you'll, I'll spend a lot of time. I know it's here somewhere. I just can't find it. That's what's going on here. Next so, semester, when you guys are doing residential design and you want to put paintings in your space, you can put them in the TIFF file on the painting project you did in this room a year and a half ago, and you put it on the wall, and instead of rendering it or trying to use cheesy clip art, you've got your own creative work. You can have your own gallery, your own virtual gallery. That I, so here's how it works. If you say place a decal, it'll bring me to this decal type dialog. I don't have any created just yet. I will create a new decal. And oh, this is going to be, oh, my uh, new poster one. All you got to do is basically go out and find an image file, any bitmap file, any uh, JPEG, any TIFF file, whatever it is you can find. So go ahead and see if you can find something on your computer. I don't have very much artwork on this computer, so I actually had to go and I'm going to grab an image that's just kind of silly, but it's one of the few I have on this machine. Uh, where to go? Graphics library. Oh, actually, I could probably grab something else. But what I've been doing is grabbing my, <laughs> it's really my Facebook badges. Choose that. There I am. Okay, I am now basically a decal. So, and what can I do? If I'm really narcissistic, I can go ahead and put myself up on the wall as much as I want to. Now, you don't see me just yet because in a shaded view, it's going to be efficient. It's not going to show that for us right now. Okay, if I switch over from a shaded view to a realistic view, it'll go through and actually show you the image. So let's talk about realistic for just a second because realistic was actually one of the things, I think it changed in 2011, but it's a really nice mode that it has some good things about it but it doesn't do everything you want. Realistic is like halfway to a ring. Okay, so you have shaded. Realistic says, hey, if you've gone ahead and you've assigned a material, like appearance, to something, I will show you the appearance on that object. I'm not yet going to go ahead and figure out all the light bouncing and the ray tracing and all the bump mapping and things that will really make a really fantastic video. Well, at least get you started on it. So that's how you, if you just want to start seeing where you've assigned materials and haven't assigned materials, looks like I'm good on the floor, looks like I'm good on the door. That's looking pretty plain right there. We're using for details to show you stuff like that. The other thing you can do is with those of you who are terribly underprepared for in the, in the presentation, you go to a view like this, you grab the window. It may not be as good as a rendering, but if you don't have four days per rendering left before the review, you grab these, at least you have the information you need to present. Yeah, so it's a little cartoony, but it's definitely, it's it gets you there awfully quick. And it's better than not having anything like a number of new tags. I'm really narcissistic, so you can go ahead and stretch those. But go ahead and uh, think about putting that, and you can put these decals on any surface. You can put them on the front of a TV, you can put them on a wall, you can put them on the floor. You know, or a very nice thing, again, if you want to really sort of quick, if you have an image of the whole side of the room, a nice dead-on image, I can stretch that across the entire wall and really get an incredible amount of detail on the cheek. What does... When you render, mm -hmm. render, you've got the decal on. 
what um, does it take on the flexibility of the wall, or does it design separately, or is it matte finish? That's actually a very, I don't know the answer to that one offhand. I'm guessing that it doesn't do, have a whole lot of like reflectivity, it doesn't have a whole lot of lighting. I imagine it's going to be relatively flat, but I don't know. That's a very good one, because I, I, I don't know of a good way to control that anywhere in the interface. Yeah? If you put a decal on the TV and you want to have the TV, if everyone's turned on, if you want to have some sort of illuminance to it, um, could you still do that and make it? Let's kind of think about it. That's kind of interesting, because it's almost this issue I think I would do it this way. I would take the decal and I would actually, you know, take it into the photo editor and actually would drop out the alpha channel. I would basically give it a little bit of transparency. Okay, so that you still have the primary color but you're letting some color bleed through. And I'd still have the material for the glass surface that has the glare or has the illuminance behind it. And I think that would give you that effect. But I haven't actually tried that. Isn't there something in the decal properties where you can set it to like if it's glowing or it's like underlit or something? Let's check it out. I'm just seeing random stuff there. That's in terms of the type properties. Let's see what else is going on here. Subcategory, lock proportions. I don't see much in terms of controlling that. So that may be in one of the other rendering programs in terms of being able to do that. But, but should I, I recently, because I used to decal last semester and there was something to set like, um, the texture for it, and mm -hmm. one of the things was also that it's like, well, it's like it's backlit or something like that. Really? Like it has like, yeah. That is a very cool thing if you can. I just don't know how to do that without saying, oh, look, because that would actually be fantastic. Or you want to go dig in and like, let us, that'd be, that'd be really good to know, because it's, uh, yeah. I always use these, again, yeah, kind of on the cheap a little bit, but it's, uh, yeah, if we can get more mileage out of them, all the better, because I think decals are really pretty powerful. Okay. Yeah, these are just kind of random things you can do for creating like uh, just, you know, just sort of painting effects or wallpaper effects and stuff like that. I want to show you a couple tricks today just for, oh, it's kind of creating different types of forms, forms that are a little bit difficult to work with. Like, have, have you played at all with, uh, there's this notion of if you have a curving wall or a wall that actually sort of slopes up or kind of tilts at a funny angle, it's really all those walls that aren't strictly kind of straight up and down, but have interesting curved and twisted and distorted shapes. Have you done anything with uh, conceptual masses to generate those things, or is that sort of new territory for you? Was that? Is that a new? Okay, let me show you kind of a, a quickie on that, and then I'll show you something else for a topic that Gwen brought up the other day, which is a really hard one, which is curtains and drapery and stuff like that. Good. There's, there's always something for everyone in here. Okay, so let me do this whole thing about if you want to create a surface, really almost any arbitrary surface. The deal is, Revit is really good at making things that go straight up and down, we get at that sort of curving in the XY direction, but as soon as you start having a surface that has a, like a double curvature to it, where you're sort of torquing it out in two different directions, like a lot of modern organic architecture has, it's pretty hard to do it. Okay, you can though, but you have to kind of use a special way of doing it. There's a whole set of tools called massing tools, and really what they let you do is really create a construction geometry, something where you're just basically defining a surface and using points to sort of give that surface some curvature and kind of just deform it. And then after we've created that surface okay, as a form, we can then make a wall out of it or make a roof out of it or make a floor out of it, whatever you want. And it's just sort of a general category of things you can do. So let me kind of show you some of the flexibility you get out of that because it's really kind of very, very powerful when you start using it. Now, by default, masses are hidden because masses are, you know, since they're more construction geometry, they tend not to actually show up and be rendered and do whatever you do at the tail end. So they typically hide them from you. Let me go ahead and just create one. I typically go through and do things like, oh, if I just want a fairly simple thing, I'll do, I'll start by just creating a very simple shape, like a rectangle or a box or something like that. And I'll choose it and I can say create a form out of it. Okay, and that'll just give me sort of what we get in the standard product. Okay, but the nice thing about this form is I can go through and choose it and I can sort of push and pull the surfaces. Or if I grab an edge, see if I can grab that edge right there. I can push or pull that in. So if you need a wall that slopes back, that's the best way to do it, is to actually go through and create something like this 
and slope it back here. So that'll work for a sloping curtain wall, that'll work for a sloping uh, brick wall, whatever you want. If you have something that doesn't go straight up and down, that's the easiest way to do it. Okay. Another thing you can do if you want to sort of go create walls that are sort of even more elaborate is, oh, let me do it to this end wall over here. I'll slope that one out. Okay, but I can even go ahead and grab the points. And if I grab that point and start pushing and pulling it around, you might recognize that what I'm doing is actually creating a very compound curve. That whole thing up here on the top and this whole thing on the side, those two surfaces actually have sort of like two degrees of curvature to them right now. And those are pretty hard to model kind of using any of the standard tools. But if you can create a basic form for working with them, okay, do something like this. And let me finish that. Okay, there it is, just as the form. We can convert that into a real wall or a real floor or a real roof. And how you do that is you choose under massing and site, there's this wall by face tool. And that'll let us basically choose a face, choose the properties of what you want it to have. Actually, I should have chosen the properties first. Let me back up. Okay, I'll choose the properties. Let me make this, oh, like the brick wall or something like that. I will now go through and I got the brick wall there. Hang on. Modify place wall, massing in sight, wall. There we go. Okay. And when I zoom on in, it may be a little hard to see. Well, it's realistic right now. Let me get so you're not seeing it because it's sort of obliqued by the uh, other one. It's actually creating a, uh, it's sort of a, a tilted, curved, it's a wall that's actually sort of following that shape. Same sort of thing will work in terms of, oh, let me go ahead. It doesn't really matter whether you do it as a roof or a wall. Either one will sort of work. I can choose some sort of material, even like glazing or something like that. And if I choose that surface, actually, I'll take that back. For glazing, I shouldn't do it that way. I should stick to the standard ones. Hang on, if I really want, okay, I'll keep one of the standard ones, like a, uh, just a, like wood rafters or something. <coughs> okay, that's now sort of a twisting, contorting, distorted thing there. If I want to actually do that with glazing, as we do a lot right now, just go ahead and use a slightly different system. Use curtain system as opposed to using a wall or a roof. And I can choose that surface. Oh, well, five by 10 is gonna be very big. Let me go ahead and create a new type. I'm gonna create a type which is, oh, say two by two. Just a finer grid. Two by two. And I'll create that system. Okay, and I'll start having a twisted, contorted uh, grid system that does something like that. It's two by two in plan. That's interesting. But it's actually sort of twisted a little bit in terms of uh, what's going on in the real geometry. Okay, now this ability to work with the masses and stuff like that, it's great for sloping walls and kind of tilting walls. It's also really good if you have sort of, sort of undulating organic forms. Let me show you how you can do that because it really is kind of easy to work with. What you do is, let me kind of like, I'll just gonna rotate this thing up. You can create boxes and stuff like that, that's cool, but if you actually want to have a surface, kind of like you have in Rhino, where you just arbitrarily follow different curves and blend them together, how you do that is I'll go back to massing in sight, and I'll say in place mass again. I'm gonna create another one, but this one, I'm actually gonna go ahead and just draw a couple curves. I'll draw some sort of curve down on level one, some spliny thing. Okay, that's my level one curve. I'm gonna go ahead and draw another curve, but draw it up on level two. Okay, just higher up in the building. Okay, sort of arbitrary, but this will get the point across. I got those two different curves. If I'd like to make a surface out of those two curves, I can grab one. I'm gonna control click, click to grab the other one. And I'll just say, let's go ahead and make a form out of those things. Okay, and that has now created basically a surface that we can then use to go through and generate a wall. So once you have a surface, that's always your first step. It's gonna complain that it's only a surface. We can't actually do things like compute an area with it. That's okay. 
And if I want to make that into a wall surface, again, I'll just kind of choose something more generic. In this case, I'll make that a wall surface. Okay, and now I actually have this incredibly organic, whatever's going on wall. In terms of making that happen. Okay, if I want to cut holes in that thing, I could uh, use voids to kind of cut things in and cut out different sections. But you get an incredible amount of, you know, a lot of flexibility in this in terms of really creating whatever you need to. You know, so this whole, this massing tool thing really is, it buys you a whole level of power moving far beyond kind of what's just started inside the box when you really want to start customizing things. Okay, so pretty good on that. Feel okay there? Okay, let me go ahead and give you another one that's kind of a quickie. It's the whole issue of curtains. Curtains are really, this is one of these one of hard ones. Anything like curtains, drapery, blinds, stuff like that. Revit's traditionally not been very good modeling and stuff like that. So you actually almost have to fool it a little bit in terms of thinking about what works. If you think about how curtains work or vertical blinds or something like that, they're the very regular systems. They tend to be. You know, you have a blind slant every three or four inches. Okay, or you have some sort of bunched fabric or pleated fabric at a very regular distance. Okay. So you think about in Revit, what else do we have in architecture which is kind of like that, where I can kind of draw some arbitrary path and at a very regular distance we sort of drop something down in that location. And the thing that's probably closest to it, it's going to sound really weird, is a rail. Okay, because when we go through and do railings and we put all the little horizontal or vertical balusters in there, okay, it's actually a very similar sort of operation where we can draw a path, it'll go through and like uh, put the little uh, tickets where we want them. So let's kind of show you how you can use that. Because it's really, I got it, uh, it's just a trick that you can use for doing this. So for example, if I go back and I go to the standard railing tool, I say I want to put a railing around something. I can draw straight lines, or I can go through and draw curved lines. Okay, and when I finish that out, it'll create some sort of little railing for me. Okay, and that's kind of a boring railing. It's kind of okay. They have the uh, guardrails, which are a little bit better. Okay, again, these aren't all that interesting in terms of, uh, or the pipe railing, which is a little more interesting. Now, don't feel like you're stuck with this stuff because you, know, you don't have to keep on using Revit's standard old boring railings and stuff like that. If you want a glass railing, if you want something that's a uh, wire rope, if you want a lot of different sort of things, feel free to go through and customize these. You can go ahead and say that I want to duplicate this and I'm going to make it you know, my custom railing. and change it. So here's the structure of the rail pieces. Okay, we also have the structure of the baluster pieces. If you want to take out pieces, you can. These are all set up to sort of meet code requirements. But if you want to sort of take out some of these, you can. A very common one I do when people want to do glass rails is I'll actually make something, I'll call it a rail, but it'll actually be a sweep, which is a piece of glass that's like two and a half feet tall by a half inch thick and sort of sweep it around the rail. It's one of the easiest ways to go ahead and get a glass rail. Like that. But you can play with this and really get a lot of customization out of it. So if I do that and I change this to my custom railing, and I'll change that, so instead it's going to be a rectangular handrail at the top, whatever it is, I'll say OK. And you'll see the railing will change. So we can really just make that really be whatever we want it to be. So that part's pretty good in terms of getting started. So let's go ahead and push that a little bit further. If you actually want to start thinking about using that for curtains or drapery, okay, I actually set up a custom baluster type, which is like a little vertical slat or a bunched piece of fabric to do that. Let me show you what it actually looks like when you use it, because it works out pretty well. Let me open this up. I'm going to open up another thing out here. Oh, where did it go? It's hanging around in my Dropbox. And let me go to, I should do a much better job of locating these things before we get started. It's Autodesk Education, Team Sharing, Schools, NGIT, Interior Design, Window Coverings. Okay, I'm a little too organized. Well, at times. <laughs> well, let's show you how it works. Here's basically the deal. If I want to create something that's like a curtain or something like that, I can go through and choose railing. 
But depending upon how I set this up, I can kind of stick with my standard handrails and stuff like that, or I could actually go ahead and set up some different railing types that use different what we'll call ballisters, but they're really just vertical pickets, things like that. So for example, if I want to have a vertical blind where everything's open, I can go ahead and trace a path and really be any path I want, even a curved path. And when I finish that, let's zoom on in there. I have this thing which is an awful lot like vertical lines. Okay. Going through and making those closed is really just as simple as going through and changing to another one where all I've done is I've just oriented the uh, vertical pickets so they're going in the other direction. So that's a closed system. Or that's a 45 degree open system. Okay, but I'll give you this part. It's a kind of a really cool one to work with. It just sort of gives you the ability to start actually having a little bit of detailed control over doing things like that. And this is one of the things that's been very, very hard for us to do in the past and get it to render accurately. Now, those were kind of okay. Let me kind of even show you what this looks like. If I come on back in there into the vertical blinds and I look at the veins, all the 45 degree vein is, is something that looks like this. Can I open it? Let me say that. It looks like it's not going to let me open it in terms of editing it right here. I'd have to open it anyways. I won't do it right now in the interest of time. But I can give you those pieces to work with. The other one that's kind of nice that I set up is one that actually, oh, I'll show this to you in plan. That may make more sense. So there they are, all kind of rendering, doing what they should be doing kind of in the plan view. If you want to go through and do something which is more like a curtain, let's do that. I'll say railing and I'll just choose this other one. The difference here is just going to be that as opposed to being a lot of little individual sticks, this is actually like loops that come back on each other. So as I go zooming along and draw this in here, and finish it up, okay, it's more like a bunched fabric or something like that. The cool thing about this, and what I really thought I was pleasantly surprised to see that it did, that was kind of nice, was that as you go through and use it, even if you go through and, let me find the railing, there it is, create circles, very tight circles, or things like that. Yeah, it still does a good job of joining them all up. So the nice thing is now, we can go ahead and take something like this, let me flip back out to 3D, There are those things that are kind of hanging around right there. My vertical blinds, and I also have my little <coughs> curtain there. My curtain, I'm not sure if you can tell, it's kind of a sheer pattern. I actually put applied some sort of lace pattern that I found in the library to it, which only to test it in terms of it would be a very hard thing to render if it was a lace pattern or something like that. But this is it in sort of realistic view. So this is the rendering on the cheap. But if I now go ahead and try to render this, actually I won't render the whole thing, it'll take a while. Actually no, let's get to rendering, I'll show you some tricks. <laughs> That'll actually be a good thing. Let's say we wanted to actually go through and render this, because that's really the next sort of step you may want to get to in terms of tips we want to share with you. Okay, let's talk about rendering and some things you can do right within Revit that may help you out a little bit in terms of working with the stuff. One is, okay, just turning on realistic as opposed to shaded. That'll get you sort of rendering on the cheap. No time involved, get you at least a sense of the materiality. Okay, right down to, it's a little goofy, but you can sort of see my lace fabric. <laughs> okay, don't fault me for my design. I just pull things out of the library. <laughs> I'm not a real big lace fan. Uh, once we want to go through and do things like rendering, I can open the rendering dialog. Let's think about some of the things that happen here that will really help you out. Probably one of the most critical things up here is just some of these things right up at the top. And I'm going to always advocate that you start really, really rough and work your way in. And you probably know this because every time you get more and more finely detailed, it takes a lot more time to render. So. If I want to start things out, a really good thing to go out with is start by just sort of rendering a region as opposed to the entire thing. If you know that you really are only interested in sort of the effect of that material you change in a very small section of the image, go ahead and only render that small section of the image. You don't need to re-render and wait the 30 minutes for all the rest of the things to render and be computed that aren't included into whatever the decision is you're trying to make right now. So only render that little piece of it. 
if you want it. Go ahead and say render. It'll go through and do its computations and hopefully be pretty quick about what it's doing. I shouldn't do this lace. This lace in particular is especially bad because it's actually, there's a lot of transparency in terms of what's going on. But I think in terms of what you're doing with your rendering, you're realizing that things that are sort of like pseudo transparent and things that are highly reflective that involve an awful lot of light bouncing around and kind of trying to think about how the appearance is filtered and changed by the light and kind of the gauziness, you know, really slow down rendering quite a bit. So only render the part you need. That's the part I would start out with in terms of what's going on. Okay, let's let that finish up. The rendering engine in Revit has changed quite a bit through the years. It used to be AccuRender, and it was something else for a while, and now I believe it's Mental Ray, or at least a subset of Metal Ray that's in here. My understanding is so, and it has a lot of the features, but not everything, or at least let's tell you how you get to sort of more of the features. There's this whole notion there's a draft rendering. The thing that will distinguish draft rendering is we only go through do one pass, and especially its edges and things. It's kind of very granular, it's very pixelated, things like that. As you want to go through and get to higher levels of resolution, as you go sort of pulling down through here, from low to medium to high, all, lots of different settings kind of keep on changing. If you want to see what those settings are and have access to them, you can do this. Go on down there and you can choose any sort of rough group of settings, or leave it at draft if you want, but then say that you want to edit them. Okay. And you can actually see for each of the different levels what's happening. Now, it won't let you change medium, low, draft. Those are sort of preset. If you want to have my custom settings, I can copy them to them, and I have something that's custom for this specific view, where you can really start to control the amount of anti-aliasing, the number of reflections, the number of refractions. One that I find is sort of especially important when I go through and do uh, what uh, any sort of interior rendering is the whole notion of the indirect illumination bounces. Okay, so. If you really, if you have light coming in either from you know, artificial sources or coming in from an outside source, if that's very, very low, the light only bounces from the window like down onto the floor as one bounce, and maybe up onto the wall as the second bounce. But if you really want it to resolve nicely and kind of do all the bouncing and really kind of filter out to the actual soft effect that we're going to get in the real room, turning that up is probably the single most effective thing you can do in terms of controlling the light. And the nice thing is, you can turn that up even in the low quality renderings just to sort of start controlling the lighting without having to take the hit of having to go through and have a high quality rendering where it's anti-aliasing everything to the nth degree and taking hours to do. So that's one that I highly recommend turning on. There's one down here, maybe you have experience with this, Glenn, it's like Daylight Portals. Do you ever use that? Oh, I don't know the thing. Oh, no worries. It's one of the things I actually stay away from. Because the ideas we're supposed to, it used to be really important. You had to say, this was a glass surface that daylight could actually come through, and you'd have to choose I, I the kernel. All else. the time I've seen that used was two years ago when John was here, yeah. and I was talking about we were trying to transfer the data to um, Echo mm -hmm. and we had to use that. Oh, to actually get it to like a, interesting. Okay. Like, this is one I actually stay away from, because as soon as you turn that on, it's supposed to be all about daylighting coming through the windows, but all of a sudden, everything takes 10 times as long to do. So I'm not sure what it's doing, but whatever it's doing, it's a big hit. So what I'll tend to advise people to do is, as opposed to going through and uh, doing, yeah, something like, yeah, as opposed to turning that on, just turn up the number of light bounces, and you tend to be a whole lot better off in terms of doing that. It's yeah. the default of those on or off. It's, all, it's defaulting to off. It defaults to off. Yes. So that if they don't edit it, they're not... You know, they won't hit that. Okay. You're sort of tempted to go down that path, but then that's when you go out to dinner and come back because you're not going to like... It's going to be a, a, it'll be a long time coming. Well, the way this, this last part just went was collapse the spring break. Oh, that's, that's a whole nother issue. Okay. I'll take that. I believe that's true. Okay, another thing that I'm going to talk about, especially on your interior renderings that I won't show you now, but it's a really good thing to kind of know about, because, you know, just in the interest of time, adjusting exposure. Let's talk about that. 
especially on your interior renderings, know about this and use this. Here's the deal. You go ahead, you do these exterior renderings, everything is cool because the sun is so, so bright. Yeah, it pretty much takes care of your lighting condition. The sun doesn't, you know, and we calibrate for the sun. Exterior renderings are really hard to get wrong. They tend to look pretty good. Interior renderings are really, really hard because the amount of brightness coming through that window relative to the amount of light in here, it's hard to kind of get it balanced right. And, and you've all had the experience, you go to some fantastic site, you put your friend right in front of the big monumental view, you take the picture, it's bright in the background and you can't see their faces. Because it's, we just have an exposure problem. We have, there's too much brightness in the background, we have to recalibrate our exposure. So you have to do the same thing with your interior renderings too. If you have any sort of really bright surface, like a window in there, what will tend to happen is red will overcompensate. It'll be too bright over here, too dark in here. So you think, oh, okay, I better start throwing lights in there. So you throw a light over here, you put a torch here over there, you put a download over here, and you start flooding the space with light that it slows things down and it still doesn't make that big a difference. Because really, compared to that, you're just not really even be able to compete with the amount of light coming into that window. So what you need to do is go ahead and after you do your rendering and it's sitting over here looking relatively dark, open up this adjust exposure and just slide that little slider up there, brighter to darker. And don't kind of slide it over, kind of tap it over a little at a time and kind of see what happens. It'll be amazed at how much better the image will start to look. So it'll pull light out of the image that you don't think is there. Okay, so as opposed to adding a bunch of lights, and every time you add more and more lights, it increases the complexity of the computations and slows things down. Okay, go ahead and use that slider when you can, because it'll really, you know, you'll be amazed at what it does to kind of like uh, kind of pick things up. So that goes for people like Nora and Nikki. Yeah, because once you've gone through and done all the computations. You know, you know, you don't have, you know, it'll brighten everything up without having to redo the computations. So you can really, especially it's an hour to the review, you don't have time to do it again. Just tweak it on the exposure level. Or, hey, don't be afraid. Take your image out of here, take it over to Photoshop and kind of brighten it up there. If you're more comfortable working with that tool, you know, that's okay. You can do it here, but, you know, don't feel hamstrung that you have to go ahead and do a whole nother revision just to kind of get there because rendering really is the slowest piece of all this. Okay, let me finish up with one final thing on the rendering, and that's sort of something that you guys would be kind of useful to know about, especially for our folks who are taking a long time with the renders. And that is something called cloud rendering. And let me see if I can even find where that is hiding in there now. Oh, that is new in 2012. Let's see if I can even find it in here. So I put it on this machine. I gotta find online, there it is. Render in the cloud. This is something that you need an Autodesk account for, and if you're downloading all the software, you probably already have one. Let's see if I can even get in. Hang on. For those of you who have not, not, not the image to change, for those of you who are also then going to the community site and you have it on your laptop to your home, then you may not have some of the power that you have on the studio machine. Or even actually, you could do it from the studio machine as well. Uh, it allows you, the studio machine is the network enterprise version, it's not the download version, the image. Mm -hmm. um, it um, may be faster than what you guys are Sounds good. Uh -huh. So here's how this works. You set up all your rendering settings, you're kind of okay. You know you're gonna have to put it on this machine. You're already planning to put a little note on the machine saying please do not disturb because you know it's gonna take three days and chances are it is gonna get disturbed and you're not gonna get your, okay. Rendering in the cloud is what's gonna help you here. So rendering in the cloud says, hey, take this rendering job. Step one, select the 3D views you want to render. Step two, it'll notify you when your images are ready. Step three, go to the gallery and download them. Step one, choose the 3D views you want to render. I only have this one 3D view. Choose the quality, choose the size, choose the file format. Step two, send it off. 
Okay, <laughs> go home because it's going to go off to the servers and be working somewhere else on some Amazon or Google machine. Okay, and come back to you. You'll get an email message that says, "Hey, your rendering is ready." When it's ready, step three: come on back. You know, you get your image and stuff like that. Okay, fantastic service in terms of doing it. Gives you pretty much the same quality. It's not a hundred percent. I think if you take it into three D Studio Max, you get something a little bit better, but it's pretty darn good for what it does. The only downside of this, you have to watch out for, is that for free, as a student, you get 25 renderings to do for okay. So, since it's pretty late in the semester and you're getting close to final reviews, you may not burn through those. But, okay, as you're doing your drafts and just trying to figure out, is my lighting right, or are my materials about right, don't blow away your 25 on that. It's like, you know, they're too valuable for that. Okay. Keep doing that locally. If it's going to take only 10 minutes, do it here. Okay. For that final presentation that's going to take eight hours and blah, 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 okay. send that one off to the cloud. Okay. Because, you know, boom. You know, use, use your money wisely. Or use your free tokens wisely in terms of doing that. Okay. You know, it'll pull it back and stuff like that. So, While they are doing this, they can still use their own machine before yeah. they can do work. Now, is there is the interface to do this in 2012, or is it set? In other words, if they've got 2011 on the machine now, yeah. can, they have, can they have access to this? That is, I think it only is accessible within 2012, because there was a special extension you had to add. It definitely is, it's 100% in, it's, it's in the base release of 2013. In 2012, you have to sort of do a little thing to add it in there. If anyone's interested, like, you know, we should send out an email, unless we can give you an address that explains how to do this and how to set it up on your machine. That means your studio machines, you're going to be doing your modeling for 2013 studio machines. For those people who have uh, an additional computer or laptop, which a lot of you have for your movies or whatever else, you can, you have, since we have the licenses, you can download 2012 from the student community website, which you should all and you then take your file, you want to continue to work on certain things in the studio, you can put that file on your laptop, and because your laptop's not going to be doing processing, yeah. the laptop is only going to be the interface for that model into the student community website. That's actually a very clever way to approach it because, yeah, all you need to do is bring your model in there long enough to send it out. Okay, and then pull the image back down at the end. You know, and the nice thing about this is that, and that's really the point of it, is that you can keep on working on everything else you need to be doing as this thing's off chugging somewhere else and just getting back to you when it's done. The question? Is this not permanent uh, file or uh, Because I know that the project beyond yes. us. This is, what, this is what happened to it. Happened to it? This okay. is what happened to it. So it is project beyond. Like yeah. So this is where it ended up landing. Okay, so yeah. Go ahead and take advantage of it. It's kind of you know, underutilized now because people don't know about it there. And honestly, I was just really trying to figure out what to do with this. We gotta figure out how much demand there's gonna be and how much the load it puts on the servers. But for now, we're giving a limited number of freebies. My advice to all of you is by semester, since you get a week between the final review and the time the files are due. But you wait until, for some of them, you know, take half of them, and you wait until you make, you make the changes and you're ready for them, because you remember, you're graded on the files that you submit. That way you can get, because unlike the last project where some of you were dribbling files to me as late as two days ago, uh, it doesn't go beyond April 30th. The semester's end, the grade's going. So this is that use it that do it do a test or two prior to the review. We'll be using it for that week. That's what we're going to be prepared for service. Exactly. So you see 25 images for renders, you can't you have access to it. It'll it will it'll say, oh, you have exceeded your limit. So it's okay. It just means that for that last rendering which you were hoping to send off, you're gonna to have to do it locally as opposed to sending it off. And you're not gonna lose anything, but it, yeah, you, you may not have the time advantage you were counting on at the end. Okay, so yeah, go ahead and start playing with it and test the whole system because it really is, it's one of those things, I think everyone's just trying to figure out what this really means. The sense is that it's going to be really, very useful and people will get a lot of miles out of it, but no one's sure that could be like a, a million miles all at once or just how it's going to scale up. So yeah, you're part of our big experiment on that one. Okay? Beautiful. Okay, that for today, I think we're wrapped up on time.
get a short break and we get Kershaw's coming in next. Next! So, okay. And uh, I think that's just the first. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.